Dum de dum de dum, I'm having such a wonderful time in this level. Nothing can stop me, I'm handling it. I've mastered the level layout, I've memorized the enemy's movesets, and all I need do is march towards the boss. Dum de dum de dum, uh oh, an invader. Well look, I can handle this, I've fought worse. <laughs> Let's get ready to rock. Folks, when it comes to FromSoft's games, we're all familiar with your standard enemies, your mini-bosses and your bosses, and sometimes you'll even come across an NPC to be engaged with, perhaps for some interesting and entertaining dialogue, or maybe even an epic quest. But every now and then, pretty much always at specific points along particular levels, the game will chuck a phantom your way. Sometimes as an invader as alarmingly indicated by an on-screen notification, and other times as a special enemy who may only appear after a particular condition has been fulfilled, with them usually having their name appear over their head and or have some sort of shiny, colourful glow to them to indicate them as phantoms. Some of these enemies are a pleasure to fight, an absolute pleasure and some make me want to spit directly onto my monitor. As such, I thought it might make for an amusing video to name, and in some cases, shame, who I personally consider to be the best and worst phantoms from every Soulsborne game, though I will only be considering human-type phantoms, so stuff like the Staircase Mind Flayer from Demon Souls, Gravelord Phantoms from Dark Souls 1, or New Game Plus Phantoms from Dark Souls 2 are not included. Even though it is quite different from the rest, I normally like to include Sekiro in these videos too, but the fact is, is that that game just doesn't have phantoms in it. It does have a few apparition type enemies which appear as the game progresses, but that really doesn't count, and so I'm skipping it. If you like this video, hey, why not subscribe to the channel? I make fun videos about great games. And before I get stuck right into it, please allow me to give a massive thanks to my wonderful patrons for supporting the channel. And with all that being said, let's kick off the list with Demon's Souls. Demon's Souls was FromSoft's first foray into the whole being able to invade other people's worlds things, and of course you yourself were also subject to invasion, with this being a risk entailed by moving through a level in human form. But in addition to the actual humans trying to track you down when you're just trying to make it through the Shrine of Storms, for Christ's sake leave me alone, there are a few NPC phantoms naturally strewn throughout the game world. Some have real lore significance, like Metis, Knight of the Lance, Longbow Ulan, and Alfred, Knight of the Tower, in the last level of Boataria, whereas others seem a bit more random, like these two half-naked, club-wielding men in Stonefang Tunnel. Speaking of Boataria, though, my pick for favourite happens to be someone you see all throughout it, though he is ultimately fought as a black phantom in the same level as those other three I just mentioned. It's Ostrava, or if I'm calling him by his real name, Ariona, the son of the king. As with a few of the phantoms on my list, it's Estrava's backstory which makes the fight with him so special. You see him all throughout Boataria, where despite his fancy armour and gilded sword and shield, he's always found cowering or fleeing from hordes of soul-hungry draglings or formidable knights and in dire need of assistance from a more capable warrior all towards his goal of reaching and then confronting his royal father about how he could let Boataria fall to such ruin. Well, by the time you encounter the pampered little lordling in the king's palace level, he's just back from a visit to King Doran, and I guess the reunion didn't go so well because he's covered in blood and on death's door. It's a pretty sad moment because for as much of a pain as it can be trying to protect him from knights and reglings in the earlier levels, Estrava is still a very likeable character, but what happens directly after is what elevates this encounter so much for me, because mere seconds after he dies in human form, he comes back as a black phantom, all warmth and humanity lost, replaced with a violent yearning for souls. He doesn't really make for a super difficult fight, but he's certainly more challenging than you might expect considering all the times we had to save his bitch ass out there before. It's a very straight duel too. He solely fights with his rune sword and rune shield with no miracle trickery nor magical fuckery, which I really like. It's a simple face off against a fallen ally, made all the more dramatic and impactful because of what came before it, and what comes directly after, that being the final battle with King Alance's demonic reflection. 
As for who I think is the worst phantom in the game, well that gets us onto pure black world tendency territory, doesn't it? You do get extra enemies who appear throughout the game's levels once you get to black world tendency, like these two extra fat officials in 1-3 for example, not to mention all the primeval demons, but like I said I'm not including these things because they're based on regular enemies. What you also get on pure black world tendency however are human type enemies, and what's more is that they're humans who you can even interact with and complete quests for if you have pure white world tendency. Examples are Satsuki and the Shrine of Storms or Lord Rydell and the Tower of Latria, but my personal pick for worst goes to Skirvir the Wanderer. You can find this curious fella in a dimly lit shaft halfway down the second level of Stonefang Tunnel, and what he's searching for in this dark abyssal mine is a certain, in my opinion, awesomely named sword, the Dragon Bone Smasher. I love weapon names that leave nothing to the imagination. He's a nice enough chap, and you can get access to this massive weapon in the Dragon God boss arena if you've got pure white world tendency, after which Skirvir will reward you with pure grey stone for your troubles. If, however, you go to the same spot with pure black world tendency, Skirvir is still here alright, but he ain't sending you out on no exciting quest for a massive sword, he's gonna fry and frazzle your arse with flames and fire. In my opinion, Skirvir is the most troublesome black phantom in the game, though the number one reason for this is magic. If you're a filthy magic user yourself, you can fairly easily take off a decent chunk of his health right from the outset, because until he gets close enough he'll just walk towards you and not really attack, allowing for you to send forth a barrage of your preferred soul projectiles, but once Skirvier gets going with his own magic, you're in for a rough ride, not least of all because pure black world tendency doesn't just make special enemies and phantoms appear, it also lowers your max HP a bunch even whilst wearing the cling ring and enemies get stronger stronger too. It's not that it's extremely difficult to dodge Skirvier's fireballs or anything, but it's that if you do get hit it's gonna hurt a lot, meaning you need to play very well extra consistently. Of course, there is a very effective cheese method where you can cast the anti-magic field miracle. The reason it's so effective is that even though he'll be unable to send any magic your way for a full minute, he'll still attempt to with his talisman of beasts, leaving him totally open to attacks during the animations. Skurvier the Wanderer isn't a horrible phantom or anything, he's just a right tricky bastard who you need to be extra vigilant with. There's been several occasions where I've been performing very well on him for about a minute or two, only for me to miss time one dodge roll and now I'm dead. Fuck. While Dark Souls 1 features a respectable variety of fun phantoms to face off against, thankfully it dispensed with Demon Souls' whole world tendency thing. I mean, world tendency was a pretty interesting mechanic and all, but at the same time, it often ended up with me repeatedly having to hurl myself off the nearest cliff in whichever world I was trying to get pure black in, just so I can fight a particular enemy or nail another prime evil demon. In Dark Souls though, the only prerequisite to getting invaded is to be in human form by sacrificing a humanity at a bonfire, after which you can be ambushed by a given phantom at specific points throughout the game. This does make some of these encounters pretty damn easy to miss though, because if it's a level I feel likely to die on, I'll often just not bother turning myself human at all, because I think well there's a decent chance I'd die anyway so why bother, especially if it's on the way to a tricky boss. Well, that is certainly the case for my pick for best Dark Souls Phantom, and that Phantom is Paladin Leroy. For anyone outraged that I didn't pick Havel, even though I do love the encounter with Havel, I don't really consider him to be a Phantom. He doesn't invade you and nor does he have any sort of coloured glow, he's more like a human shaped mini boss than anything, though I admit I'm kind of splitting hairs a bit there. With Leroy though, even before the phantom business, you can actually summon him as a white phantom, it's just that it's very easily missable, with his summon sign being situated in an obscure spot that you can only reach by dropping down from the heights of the catacombs, right above that horrible, horrible section with the many, many bone wheels. The main eyebrow raising aspect of his placement here though is that the level boss in the catacombs just so happens to be Pinwheel, who just so happens to be the one boss who you absolutely do not need any help for, ever. Even so, Leroy certainly helps with the bone wheel section, and it admittedly was very entertaining to let him pretty much solo the boss, with me only taking out Pinwheel's duplicates, leading to him obliterating Pinwheel in just two hits. 
and this is New Game Plus 3 or 4 by the way. Hey. This is great and all, but I'm not putting Paladin Leroy on here because he managed two shot pinwheel. I mentioned that some phantoms are easy to miss due to many players not being in human form when moving through certain areas. And that's absolutely the case with Leroy, who is located towards the end of the Tomb of the Giants. You know, the darkest, most treacherous and arguably most dangerous level in the game. Mind you, the point where Leroy invades does stand out compared to the rest of the level, being very bright and beautiful, offering a scenic view of what looks like Ash Lake. One of the most striking things about Leroy is his appearance, with his paladin set describing him as being the first undead produced by the Way of White, one who engaged in the first undead mission to Lordran, though when you consider his proximity here with Grave Lord Nito, who lies just a bit further ahead, we can deduce that for as holy and pious as Leroy's mission and motivations may have been, his encounter with Nito did not go well, leading to him either becoming hollowed or being corrupted by the Grave Lord. In fact, if you take out Nito without beating Leroy, you forever lose the chance to fight him here. His armour is sick and all, but for me it's his weapon and shield that are the real showstoppers. It was impressive as hell seeing him use his great hammer, Grant, against Pinwheel, but having him use it on me is a different story. The encounter feels very similar to the fight with Havel, with both Dragontooth and Grant sharing the same core moveset, though the latter weapon does also have a cool Wrath of God style AoE special move. Not that it's much needed by Leroy, because he will also make use of the Wrath of God miracle, which is extra spicy here. Which brings us onto the single biggest ball ache of this encounter, the fact that it takes place on a fucking ledge. Of course, it makes it difficult for us as players because we don't want to get thrown asunder for a frustrating death, but an even bigger possible tragedy is that if you chuck him over the edge, either deliberately or by accident, you've just screwed up your only chance to get his weapon and shield. For some enemies in the game, you will automatically get their droppings, like if you kill a Black Knight, or for others like Lautrec, even if he somehow takes a tumble over the edge, like if he's, I don't know, kicked or something. You can still get his shit by just quitting out and then reloading, and there it'll be for you to pick up. But for Paladin Leroy, no. If he falls over, his stuff will appear down below where he fell, permanently out of reach, which is a shame. Even so, super cool encounter with an awesome phantom who wields a sick hammer and shield. I'm sure there are more than a few marvellous Chester fans watching who might be positively pissing themselves right now at the injustice of me snubbing him, but what can I say, I'm a Leroy lover. So I'll be honest, I'll come clean, while there are a few phantoms still to come on this list that I truly do hate, there's not really any in Dark Souls 1 that I really do dislike. None of them are all that hard, and none of them are particularly bad, but if I need to choose someone, I guess I'm going to go for Xanthus King Jeremiah. The Painted World is a banger of a level, featuring perhaps the tightest, densest design of any other level in the game, with a very distinct aesthetic too. There's even a nice wee surprise too, a nostalgic callback when you get to the central section and see these enemies which are very similar in fighting style and appearance to the Phalanx boss from Demon's Souls. But that's not where the nostalgia ends, because just off in this particularly ominous snowy section with all the box cages and impaled hollows and that creepy oral ambience, a certain invader invades. King Jeremiah. Seriously by the way, next time you're in the painted world, check this spot out and just listen. Like I said, King Jeremiah makes for another blast from the past, being very similar in appearance to the old monk from Demon's Souls, whose bizarre head wrappings were made out of a demonic golden robe. Jeremiah here also features very similar head wrappings, though they do appear a bit less mushroom-esque than the old monks. Still, without a doubt the weirdest headpiece in the game, and particularly alarming if his invasion here is your first time seeing him and you mistake his Xanthus crown for his head, because fucked up enemy heads are not at all uncommon in the painted world. Abstract headwear aside though, Jeremiah can be something of a bastard to fight, and that's because of his preferred method of inflicting pain, which is pyromancy. 
Of course, we already covered Scurvier from Demon's Souls who favoured his Flame Toss and Flame Spray spells, but Jeremiah's arsenal is somewhat more exotic, throwing out pyromancies like Great Chaos Fireball, Chaos Fire Whip and Chaos Storm. There's a big chaos theme here. Big damage moves that also cover a lot of ground. He makes for one of those enemies where you can easily go from doing great one second to getting absolutely destroyed the next by some wide-reaching bastard of a pyromancy. Like I said earlier, Jeremiah isn't really a bad phantom, and nor is he insanely hard or anything, but out of all of them, he does tend to be the one that gives me the most trouble thanks to his awkward to deal with fire nonsense and crazy damage. Now on to Dark Souls 2. Dark Souls 2 features a lot of Phantom Invaders, by far the most out of any of the Souls games, but I'm also of the opinion that its Phantom fights are largely, how do I put this, not good. I'm not out to shit on Dark Souls 2 or anything, in fact it might actually be the FromSoft game I've played through more than any of the others, and I've had a ton of fun with it over the years, a lot of good memories, including with the PvP which I used to really enjoy many years ago. But its comparatively slower pace of combat compared to the other games in the series doesn't so much lend itself to super satisfying battles with NPC phantoms. Many phantoms themselves are kinda on the bland side too to be honest. I'm not talking about your actual characters like your Luca Teals and your Ben Hartz and your Shalquard the Cats mind you, they're great, especially the Kitty Cat, but your Woodland Child Gully, your Merciless Ruinas, and your peculiar Kindle Lures, well, they just don't really do it for me, especially because most Dark Souls 2 invasions tend to play out like this, where you hit the enemy and try and keep them stun locked until their health is gone. Boo. But there are a few standout phantoms that have a bit more flavour to them, a bit more spice. And that brings us to my pick for best Dark Souls 2 phantom, Dragonfang Villard. You encounter this draconic warrior pretty damn far into the game as you're ascending the Dragon Shrine for an audience with the Ancient Dragon. Of course, the main gimmick here, as introduced in the score of the First Sin edition, is that while you see a lot of Dragon Warriors throughout this level, they will not attack you as long as you defeat the Drake Keeper Knight in each section, though they also hate it when you summon in a White Phantom. Sure wish I'd had known that here. There's a wee optional section you can turn into though, one that I completely missed over several of my early playthroughs too, which eventually leads to a spiral staircase. And at the midpoint of the ascension you'll get invaded by Dragonfang Villard, though you don't immediately see him, which is always a concern in these games. No one likes being backstabbed by some sneaky phantom, do they? As far as I know, Villard won't actually converge down upon your location here, but if you continue up, you can see him standing sentinel in front of a large petrified egg. Unless you're on New Game Plus like I am and you already nabbed it on a previous playthrough, in which case it won't be here, but I digress. Like Osrava from earlier, Dragonfang Villard is another example of a straightforward, honest to goodness fight. He's wearing the black dragon set, wielding the black dragon shield, and swinging his black dragon greatsword with gay abandon. With all this equipment being a reference to Calamite from Dark Souls 1. The item description for the greatsword even mentions, The black dragon lost its tail to a brave warrior in a magnificent battle, and the tail was later used to forge several legendary weapons. Villard doesn't use any fancy tricks. He doesn't try to roast you with pyromancy, attempt to shock you with miracles, try to light you up with sorcery, or try to hex you with hexes. He just makes for a very solid opponent, a sword-wielding warrior, and I like the way he appears here in front of the petrified egg, which can be given to Magarold over in Iron Keep to allow you to join the Dragon Remnant's Covenant, which in turn allows you to get your own hands on all that slick as hell black dragon gear. I've done a bunch of these best and worst of Soulsborne lists now, and if you've watched a few of my others, you'll sometimes hear me say something along the lines of, AHA! Now for this game, before I even started putting together my list, I knew exactly who I was going to be picking. And indeed, please allow me to express much the same sentiment here for Dark Souls 2's worst phantom, because it was always going to be Maldrin the Assassin, he's a prick. That's not to say that there weren't other prime candidates for the position. Indeed, I strongly considered Jester Thomas with his infernal pyromancies and irritating costume. And certainly the Forlorn who always seem to invade right when the last thing you want is an invasion. But for me, Maldrin takes the cake. He is pure obnoxiousness. Not by coincidence, but by design. As strange as it may sound though, 
even though he's my pick for worst phantom in the game, I'd also completely understand if someone were to consider him to be the best in the game, because he's by far Dark Souls 2's most unconventional phantom. The first time most players are likely to come across Maldrin, or at least the first time I came across him, was in Broom Tower and the Crown of the Old Iron King DLC, with this having been the second DLC released for Dark Souls 2 after Crown of the Sunken King. I was getting my arse kicked, but loving the hell out of the level. I specifically remember exclaiming to myself at the time, I love this level. Then I came to this massive chain, stretching from one tower to another, and it was all so sick. But then, an invasion. Just like with Dragonfang Villard, this invader's location wasn't immediately apparent, but he happened to be hiding behind this nearby wall. Hmm, hiding. Kind of an odd thing for a phantom to be doing, isn't it? In most cases, phantoms will instantly start moving towards you upon spawning, or even stand there in the open like Villard, but sneakiness isn't something I'm used to. Well, the thing is, Maldron the Assassin's entire shtick is to behave exactly like a phantom shouldn't. In fact, he behaves exactly like a particularly cheap and irritating player would. His weapon is a really big part of this, that being the Grand Lance. It has that accursed Dark Souls 2 tracking, has great range, and the R2 often stunlocks you for multiple hits, with each hit being more aggravating than the last, and often catching you out at the end even if you roll to avoid it. He's got a crap ton of HP too, meaning you can't just get in there and delete his HP with a few powerful attacks. But the worst thing about Maldrin is that just when you do start to get a feel for his behaviour, just as you seem to be gaining the upper hand, he'll flee. And not only will he flee, but he will flee down there, you know, this dark zone that causes constant curse buildup that is also filled with buffed up enemies. I'd love to show you footage of me nailing Maldron here, but I don't have any, because I didn't. Because I hate fighting him, and because you don't even get any good loot for killing him. And because he just comes right bloody well back again in Alien Lois, but he is just as much of a pain in the neck. This space that he appears in here is a big tricky level too, with lots of space and elevation for him to run off to, and lots of annoying enemies for him to hide behind, though that's if you manage to avoid getting fatally backstabbed by him whilst pulling a lever, god forbid. I've heard Maldron described as both the best and worst phantom ever made by FromSoft, and I think that's a pretty great description, though I personally lean more towards the worst side of things, because for as advanced and uncanny as Maldron's AI absolutely is, he's simply very unpleasant and aggravating to fight. Maldron the Assassin? <laughs> More like Maldron the ass, ass in. Fuck you, Maldron. As discussed, I loved invasions in Dark Souls 1, but generally found them to be far less enjoyable in the sequel. But Dark Souls 3 is where I thought they came way back up in quality, in large part because of how much quicker and slicker this game's combat feels compared to its predecessor, which also resulted in far more difficult invasions, I think. Have to say, it was really difficult for me to try and pick favourites with Dark Souls 3 because by and large, nearly all its phantoms range from good to great. But one I've always particularly enjoyed is Night Slayer Zorik. This is another phantom who you encounter more than once, with both invasions occurring within particularly deep and deathly locations. The first invasion is in the Catacombs of Karthus, and it's quite a fiendish one too, with Sorig's glowing red form appearing right behind you as you enter into a dead end, though as he draws near, you catch sight of a very special weapon, the Fume Ultra Greatsword. As anyone who's played the Dark Souls trilogy knows, the third entry is positively a wash, with references to the first entry, some minor and some major, but callbacks to Dark Souls 2 occur far less frequently. Even so, the sight of this black slate greatsword, the single heaviest greatsword in the game, more than made up for it as far as this humble Scottish YouTuber is concerned. A YouTuber who is on record as being one who considers the Fume Knight to be one of the all-time greatest Soulsborne bosses. There's even more references here too, because Sorig's Night Slayer's ring is the same as the Ivory Warrior ring obtainable in Dark Souls 2's Crown of the Ivory King DLC, and he's wearing the Black Iron set from Dark Souls 1. Sorig pretty much fights like how you might expect, given his choice of weapon. The game has plenty of fancier phantoms who utilise quick combos, 
problematic pyromancies and soul-rending sorceries, and there's room for all that sort of stuff, and it's needed to spice up the game's one-on-one -on -one combat. But sometimes there's nothing better than a powerful, chunky knight with a massive weapon that you really, really don't want to get hit by. Although their utilisation wasn't quite as solid compared to Elden Ring's Ashes of War, Dark Souls 3 did of course feature weapon arts, and Sorig also mixes things up with these which can easily trip up your timing with their weird animations, which precede his powerful sweeps and slams. To many players disappointment, I'm sure, you do not get the Fume Ultra Greatsword for nailing Night Slayer Sorek here, instead just getting awarded with his Night Slayer's Ring, but if you delve even deeper down below the catacombs and into the Demon Ruins, aka the weakest level in the game I think, he once again invades, at a particularly fiery section too, though this time he does actually drop his sword, now that's what I'm talking about. So, got to be honest, like with the first Dark Souls, there's really not a single Phantom in Dark Souls 3 that I think is bad. There are some very tough ones for sure, like Silver Knight Lido who appears in the Ringed City, and Livid Pyromancer Dunnell who appears in the Painted World, but there's none I really hate. So instead of awarding this spot to a Phantom that stinks, I'm going to give it to the one who historically has given me the most trouble, Sir Wilhelm. I actually really like Wilhelm as a character, in fact he's one of my favourite characters in the game, even though there's not really a questline associated with him. You first see him as you approach the church where Elfrida awaits, standing guard outside and telling you to mind your bloody banners before entering on in. Wilhelm is a knight of Londor, who served the sable church of which Elfrida was the leader, and he still remains under her service here in the painted world of Ariando though he's not terribly pleased with your presence here, fearing that you will bring fire and destruction into this frigid haven for the lost. Even so, there's no actual battle with him just yet. The second time you see Wilhelm though, he invades your world and attacks you in an attempt at preventing you from moving on to see the painter who lives just above, the one who Gale serves, and here Wilhelm makes for one tough customer. In his left hand he sports the Dark Hand, the same crimson shield of sorts used by other warriors associated with Londor, but in his right hand he wields the Onyx Blade, a gift given to him by his sweet lady, and one which makes use of the same black flame element as the kind you see Lady Frida use in her infamously difficult third phase. As such, Wilhelm does a ton of damage with his attacks, though other than his black flame buff, he doesn't throw out anything all that fancy offensively speaking, but he's got a ton of HP, his AI seems to be that bit more advanced compared to the game's other phantoms, he can prevent you from using any spells by casting Vow of Silence, and he can heal himself with miracles, meaning tossing a dual charm at him does absolutely bugger all. Furthermore, even if you bloody well hack at him whilst he's casting a miracle, he often just won't get staggered out of the animation, though a backstab does work just fine. Wilhelm makes for a brutally difficult challenge that can pose a real headache for players desperate to make it further into the DLC because you have to fight him to get to the end of it, and some folk even try and cheese him by luring him outside so that he'll fall off the cliff. Nonetheless, difficult doesn't mean bad, and for as big a bastard as he and his black flame blade may be, I still do rate Sir Wilhelm very highly, both as a character and as a phantom. Aha, here we are finally, at my favourite Soulsborne game. Mind you, with us being out of the realm of souls here, things are a bit different. For one, even though you can be invaded by other players, there are almost no NPC invasions in this game. Instead, they're simply replaced by mad hunters who are dotted around the game world who are always to be found wielding the same manner of weapons and wearing the same sort of clothing as you, many of which do make for very challenging encounters. Hunters are some of the quickest and tankiest enemies in the game for sure. However, there is one exception to the whole hunter situation, one particular hunter who actually does invade your world, time and time and time and time again. It's Brador, the church assassin from the Old Hunters DLC. Brador can first be encountered and even spoken to just after the underground corpse pile where you fight Ludwig, except he's locked away within a cell and poses absolutely no danger to you at this time. He does ask if you hear a bell though, which at this point you can't, and even if you say you do, he will call you out for lying, and at this point there's nothing more to be done or said with Brador. However, 
the third and final large chunk of the DLC has you exploring the fishing hamlet, the place where Bergenworth carried out their original atrocities against Koz and the strange folk who live here, and it's at around the halfway point through the level where you start to hear the gentle but ominous ringing of some unseen bell, heralding the appearance of the church assassin himself. Indeed, this is Brador's thing. He'll appear in four different locations, always preceded by the bell. Over this bridge, further below in the same section, in the caves leading up to the orphan boss fight, and also right outside the cell where his actual body is being held. And furthermore, even if you've killed him at one of these locations before, next time you come back, he'll come back. It's still worth doing though, because he'll drop a piece of his bestial clothing set in every location where he's killed. They're certainly not the first hunter in this nightmare to fall victim to Brado's brutality either, because we come across Simon the Harold at the lighthouse hut who is on death's door after being repeatedly attacked by Brado, who just keeps coming back no matter how many times Simon kills him. Because that's what Brado's role is here, to take out any overly curious hunters who pry a bit too much into matters that some believe are best kept secret. Although in most cases enemy hunters typically wield weapons that you yourself might be using, Brader's weapon, the Blood Letter, is unique to him, though he will eventually drop it for you to pick up. Really cool weapon, and I think the only proper strength slash blood tinge weapon in the game. But as I think before, if you were running a blood tinge build, you pretty much had to go with skill instead of strength and use the Chikage. The Blood Letter is one of those weapons whose trick version isn't really a transformation as such, but more of a gnarly buff growing spikes and essentially turning from a hammer into a spiked hammer of blood. His weapon choice makes him a formidable foe, but the trickiest trick of Brador's is that at some point he will always drink a lead elixir, which restricts him from being able to run or dash, but also means he will not stagger and that your hits bounce right off him, making him that much more unflinching and dangerous. As unstoppable as Brador seems though, he can be stopped. If you venture back down to his underground cell and use the key dropped by Simon earlier, you can confront him, though he makes absolutely no move to stop you here, instead implying that you've done him some wrong and that you might be here to beg his forgiveness. Well, brother, I am not here to beg forgiveness. This must end. I missed. This must end. Oh, for fuck's sake, he's still alive. Okay, he's dead now. Well, that wasn't anywhere near as satisfying as I thought it would be. Like I said, Brador really is the only example of a hunter who actually invades you, and there aren't really any other example of phantom type enemies. And so for my pick for worst in Bloodborne, I'm just going to pick my least favourite hunter encounter. I have in the past expressed my disdain for the Kanehurst crow fight that occurs at the end of Eileen's questline, but for as brutally difficult as he might be, there really is one other encounter that I have even more disdain for, and it's not a fight against one hunter, but against three. It's a Yahar Ghoul trio. You see, Bloodborne's hunters can already be very rough. And that's because on top of them being able to do a lot of damage, their attacks are fast. In fact, their attacks are literally as fast as your attacks. But on top of even that, some hunters like to throw out special attacks or projectiles. Who could forget a call beyond used by the choir hunter in Bergenworth, that extravagant astral explosion responsible for many a good hunter's death? Well, how about this? How about having three hunters on your arse at once? all of whom are pretty tanky, and all of whom aggro on you as soon as any of the others have been aggroed. Furthermore, one of them can throw out tiny Tornatrice attacks which are in my experience always a one hit KO, and another can, at will, bust out a fucking cannon which is also more often than not a one hit KO, and to make matters worse. By the time you get here to face them, the hunter's lamp is completely busted, meaning it's going to be an annoying run back every time you die. Bloodborne is a game that's kinda designed around taking damage as well as dishing it out. It's why you can carry 20 blood vials or even more if you've got the communion rune equipped, it's why the healing animation is so fast, and it's why you've got the rally mechanic, there to encourage you to stay in the enemy's face and keep hammering away after taking damage, instead of running off or hiding behind a shield. But even so, it's still better to not take damage. But for encounters like the ones with the Yahar Ghoul boys here, that's scarcely even an option. 
This fight always results in a frantic, chaotic melee of swords, claws, whips and spears, with bolts flying this way and cannon shots firing that way, requiring tiresome levels of having to run away to make space, and good luck if the action happens to spill out onto the main Yahargul thoroughfare, because shit's even more dangerous out there. Something that does help massively is if you have a whip type weapon, like the hunter's cane or better yet, the beast cutter, allowing you to hit two or three of them at a time from a bit further away. But even so, Jesus, what a nightmare of a fight. It's very difficult, but in an overly messy way that doesn't feel satisfying and enjoyable, even if you manage to take all three of them down. After Bloodborne and Sekiro, Elden Ring brought phantoms and invasions and such right back in style. In fact, not only can you get invaded by NPCs in this game, but there's a bunch of opportunities to invade others, especially as part of the Volcano Manor Recusants questline. Lots of phantoms have totally unique armour sets too, which makes them extra enjoyable and interesting to fight, and a few even have great backstories to them as well. For example, the encounter with Eleonora at the end of Eurus' questline is bloody superb, and she makes for a great opponent with her wicked pole blade. But my single favourite phantom happens to be the same figure who I consider to be the single greatest NPC in Elden Ring, the Dung Eater. I spoke all about the Dung Eater's questline in my Best NPCs of Soulsborne video from a couple of weeks back, and indeed, his story is a massive part of what makes the encounter with him such a fantastic one. You first see this loathsome, rancid defiler of corpses in the Round Table hold after making it to Altus Plateau one way or another, and upon speaking to him here in his unspeakable den, where he's surrounded by mounds of cursed corpses, it is instantly made clear that this Eater of Dung is exactly as unpleasant as he looks, though nothing much can be done with him just yet. After finding one of his seedbed curses out in the world though, a couple of which are located in Landell, including one sitting in the place where the Dung Eater himself is sitting in the other version of the Round Table Hold, he will detect the scent of his pox on you, giving you the key to his cell in the subterranean shunning grounds, where you can free his corporeal form, setting him loose once more upon the inhabitants of the lands between, to spread his loathsome curse, a curse afflicted with omen horns, one which forever cuts its victims off from being able to return to the Erd Tree after death, considered to be one of the most horrific fates possible in the lands between. After returning from the Shunning Grounds, the Dung Eater is missing from the Round Table Hold, but has left behind a message instructing you to meet him in the Outer Moat in Landell's outskirts, where you can find one of his victims, Blaggard Big Boggart, inches away from death, though still cognizant enough to be dreadfully aware of his dreadful defilement, and indeed, upon passing away he too drops a seedbed curse, triggering his murderer, the Dung Eater, to appear. All the Dung Eater's hate and loathing really comes out in this fight. I mean, he still uses the same movements and animations as most any other phantom, but goddamn is he threatening, even telling you he's gonna kill you and then defile your corpse when he appears, before coming right at you with his Sword of Melos, probably the most wicked looking weapon in the whole game. Sure, you have more grotesque weapons like the Blasphemous Blade here, but the Sword of Melos is literally made from the spine of a stunted giant, also dealing bleed damage with the sharp spinal barbs at either side, designed to tear and gouge the flesh of its victims, no doubt making it all the easier to curse their corpses after their death. The Dung Eater can also use the Shriek of Melos Ash of War here, which again, really enhances the desperation and savagery of this encounter. It's just you and this filthy, screaming, abominable, omen-hearted beast battling it out upon pain of defilement. The Dung Eater doesn't make for a super difficult phantom or anything. There are a few far more difficult ones who appear elsewhere, but for me, no other encounter carries as much weight as this one, especially because this fight is just the midpoint of his quest line. You still speak to him afterwards in the round table hold, and you can even continue his work towards his ultimate goal of spreading the omen pox upon every living soul in the lands between. Even though Elden Ring is another game where I feel the general quality of its phantom type enemies is pretty damn high, there are certainly a few absolute bastards. One example that caused me pure grief on my first couple of playthroughs was Bloody Finger Okina, who invades your world over by the Church of Repose on the mountaintops of the Giants. 
Few enemies have reduced me to such a state of intense loathing and outrage after having been cut to crimson ribbons by corpse piler for the fifth goddamn time. And then there's the sanguine noble who invades near the portal to Mogwin Palace, who actually gave me trouble for very similar reasons to Okina, with her twin Rejuvia weapons also having a high damage Ash of War that causes big bleed build up. However, for as much grief and guff as these two phantoms have caused me, there's another that I've got in mind for worst. Preceptor Miriam. Don't know what it is about preceptors in Elden Ring, but they tend to be real arseholes. You've got Celavis over in his tower at the Three Sisters, who is consistently a colossal prick to both us and others, but in the Carrion Study Hall, which precedes the Lyurnia Divine Tower, Preceptor Miriam awaits, who is essentially what you get if you cross Maldrim the Assassin from Dark Souls 2 with the Grand Archives Crystal Sage from Dark Souls 3. She's even got the big floppy hat. Indeed, the name of Miriam's game is pure sorcery. Throughout the study hall, you will get ambushed by a lot of enemy spirits, but pretty much all of these are easily dispatched. Miriam, however, is not so easily dispatched. At closer ranges, she'll shower you with magic downpours to make you scramble and roll, before literally teleporting the fuck away and blasting you with the carrion nightmare that is Loretta's Great Bow. This sorcery is very powerful. It does an AoE blast even if the actual arrow does not directly hit you, and Miriam can charge it up to make it even more powerful, also throwing off your dodge timing, and you're going to have to do a lot of dodging of these in order to get close to her. And then what happens when you do get close to her? She teleports away again after just one or two hits. It's really annoying, but the last section of the study hall is the worst in this grand circular part, because here she'll often just straight up warp away before you can get to her at all, to the extent where you might be left throwing up your hands in frustration and wondering how the hell you're supposed to directly attack her, though perseverance does pay off here. If you keep chasing her, you will be able to land a hit here or there. You can try ranged attacks, but bear in mind that she's also constantly firing explosive magic arrows right back at you, so pretty tricky. Honestly though, I'd say the single most outrageous aspect of Miriam is that even if you take her out here, she just comes back later. After getting far enough into her questline, Rani gifts you the carrion inverted statue, which can be placed onto the pedestal in front of the study hall, causing the entire structure to invert, which I'm sure we can all agree is fucking awesome. What is not awesome though is when you enter into it and see Preceptor Miriam back from the dead and more annoying than ever. It's way worse here too because now you've got a ton of finger creepers creeping about and the terrain is far more treacherous due to everything having been flipped upside down. And instead of the weaker spirits from before, now you've got soldier spirits who can even throw magical consumables at you. It's actually awful. Some enemies in these games are designed to challenge you and some are there to be mowed down but every now and then you get someone or something that is solely there to piss you off and Miriam that's you. And there you have it folks, there is my list. The Soulsborne games feature loads of fun phantoms with weird names and armours and weapons and backstories, some of which seem totally random and thrown together, whilst others have way more presence and flavour, and I just wanted to make this video to talk about all the standout ones that have made an impression on me over the years, for better and for worse. As for what's next from the channel, I don't quite know. I'd like to put out some more videos in this best and worst of Soulsborne series, but we'll see. I've been playing Fear and Hunger 2 Termina recently, and I don't think I've ever both hated and loved the game so much in all my life, so maybe I'll put out a big old video on that if I ever manage to actually finish the fucking thing. Please allow me to give a massive thanks to my awesome patrons for supporting the channel. And with all that being said, cheers for watching and cheerio.